Hello everyone, my name is Samantha, or you guys can call me Sam, um, and this is the second video in the series for the Introduction to Environmental and Natural Sciences. Um, we're going to still be focusing on the living world, but rather than ecosystems, we're going to be focusing more specifically on what's in those ecosystems, and that is referred to um, as biodiversity. So yeah, let's just head into it. Okay. So again, this is a really big topic. It's pretty broad too. So I just tried to narrow it down to what I thought was uh, most beneficial to you guys. So let's just start off with genetic and species diversity. So first off, um, biodiversity might be a new term to you. So again, go watch the previous video. You can hear me explain a little bit more about how um, you can defer scientific words by using their prefixes and suffixes. Um, so biodiversity, you can split that up to bio and diversity. So bio means um, life, that's what the prefix means. And then diversity, just as it sounds like diverse, so a lot or a lot in quantity. So a lot of life, biodiversity, that's basically what it is. It's when you have a bunch of life or in different species. So genetic and species diversity. So genetic, um, let's just defer the difference. So genetic refers to DNA composition, um, and DNA is what you are made of. It's also known as deoxyribose nucleic acid, um, and that's kind of more biology, but if you guys want to head into that, then that's perfect. So yeah, so genetic is like what it sounds like, refers to the DNA um, composition of an organism. But then species diversities refers to what can visibly seen by the human eye. Um, so there's two ways to measure species diversity. Um, so the first one is species richness. So an example of this is that there's two different types of starfish. I just put this because of the graphic. So like this one right here, this one right here. There's two different types of starfish and that's how rich they are. But then there's species evenness as well. So um, how they're distributed. So yeah, their relative abundance. Um, so when environmentalists see these things, they wanna ask themselves a couple questions and these are just example ones. Like, is there a dominant species within the starfish um, species? Is there a dominant type? And then is there a rare species? Is there one that's more endemic to an area or a habitat? So just picking out key patterns of what is going to be going into these um, diversity levels, basically. All right, heading on next is something, again, very, very important that environmentalists use and utilize to determine biodiversity are different types of ecosystem services. And these can apply to literally anything you're doing in environmental science. So um, there are four main ones, provisional, regulating, supporting, and cultural. So the first one I'm gonna go over is provisional. So my teacher taught me as the five Fs, even though pharmaceuticals doesn't start with an F, it sounds like it, so it works. So there's food, um, ecosystems provide food, pharmaceuticals, or like medicine, fresh water, fiber, and fuel, or supplies basically. And those are just some like provisional. So um, yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Like I know there's certain um, places where the plants can provide medicine to cure um, specific diseases or just providing water and food and just, you know, basic necessities, right? So the next one is regulating. So this can, again, pretty self-explanatory. It's regulating something. So it could be regulating diseases, um, regulating air quality, um, regulating um, storm surges. So an example of this could be, hmm, let me think of a regulating service. Okay, so we have pest control, right? And pesticides, that's kind of a regulating um, tool we use to regulate disease and regulate pests going into crops. Um, so the next one is supporting, again, supporting something or helping something out. So habitat is the most common example of this, but there's also different cycling, like the nutrient cycles or the biogeochemical cycles we talked about last video, that's supporting as well. And then photosynthesis, cellular respiration, all of that good stuff. Um, the next one and final one is cultural. 
So nature provides some people spiritual guidance and like pleasure. And you know, people use it for rec recreational purposes as well. So like hiking or like, let me think of another good one. Um, coral reefs, we use that for like scuba diving and snorkeling. That's a good cultural example. So we just put some pictures up here. Like we have um, right here, photosynthesis. That's, you guessed it, supporting. This is more of a cultural aspect, you know, just meditating in nature. That's a really common cultural aspect as well. Disease regulation, COVID, gotta put it in there somewhere. And yeah, so I, let's head on next to the next slide. All right, so how does biodiversity provide ecosystem services? So what we just talked about, the provisioning, regulating, supporting, and cultural to the natural world. Again, lots of new terms that we went over, so hopefully you guys got that. Um, okay, so typically in a class I would have you guys brainstorm, so pause the video and think some examples how biodiversity um, provides ecosystem services to the natural world. Good job, I'm glad you're back. Okay, so some examples that I just thought of is pest regulation, like I said in the previous slide, medicine, as I said in the previous slide as well, carbon sequestration, that's kind of a big word and it basically means carbon storage or sequestration. That's just a fancy word for storage, kind of. Then pollination, um, you know, the bees go to the flowers to pollinate them. That's a um, symbiotic relationship, which we'll get to later. Um, crop variety and nutrition, that's very important because that provides us our food to survive, so that's very important. Um, flood protection from storms, if you live in those tropical regions, that's really important. And then disease control, again, pretty self-explanatory as well. And that's a man in a crop field for crop variety and nutrition. Okay, next we're going to talk about um, genetic variations. So I, this is kind of a lot to put on because, again, it's kind of complicated, but we got this. Okay. More genetically diverse, the more genetically diverse a population is, the better it can respond to environmental stressors. So, for instance, if we have a diverse population of, um, what's a good one? Rabbits. If we have a diverse population of rabbits and there ends up becoming, there's a new predator that comes to eat them. The ones that are going to be more genetically diverse are going to be the ones to survive. And that's also due to natural selection right there, which causes evolution. Um, and those are terms that are kind of, some people use them as interchangeably, but they're really not. They're very different. Um, and so these adaptations that these animals get due to genetic diversity lead to a more biologically diverse community. And when these populations evolve, the ones that do survive after natural selection and evolution, the genes um, mutate. So then that means there's going to be more that have those genes that allow them to survive. Um, so it gives some individuals some genetic traits, like I said, and it enhances their ability to survive, which is always a plus. And then they produce offspring with these traits, and so the traits just get passed on until the pattern happens again. So yeah, a little bit of basic biology. Um, a good, what I always think of when I think of this, I don't know if you guys have seen it. Have you guys seen the Lorax, the Dr. Seuss movie? Yeah. Um, so I just think of the song, How Bad Can I Be? Um, the main antagonist sings it, and then it talks all about this stuff, but puts it in a way so kids can understand. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is what I was talking about before. So ecological relationships, this is also scientifically known as symbiosis, can potentially pose threats to biodiversity that can cause an imbalance within that environment, which ultimately leads to trophic cascade. So right here, we have the three types of symbiotic relationships. We have mutualism. So a really common and prevalent example of this is the sea anemone and clownfish, like yes, from Nemo, that's a mutualistic relationship. Another one is like the bee and the flower with the pollination, yes. And then commensalism, this is where one species benefits and the other one is unaffected. So tree frogs and plants, the tree frogs use the plants, it's kind of cute, 
for protection, but then the plants don't really get anything out of it. They're kind of just unaffected. Um, so the final symbiotic relationship is parasitism and parasite. This is kind of where it comes from. Um, one species is benef benefited from the relationship and the other one is harmed. So a really common example of this is a dog and a tick. The tick has a habitat and it's thriving in the dog, but then the dog gets sick and that's what's harmed. Okay, so now we're going to talk about K and R select species. So again, this is probably an unfamiliar term if you haven't taken environmental science. So um, biodiversity depends on how many species there are. Like we said, that species richest and evenest. Those are both really important. Um, and you're probably wondering, what is K and R select species? So K, fun fact, the reason why it's capitalized is because it's a variable that stands for carrying capacity, um, uh, mathematically speaking, on graphs. So a carrying capacity is on a graph, you have, you know, your y-axis and your x-axis. Then you have this horizontal line, and that's your carrying capacity. That's the maximum amount of organisms you can fit sustainably without having an overshoot and die back of the population. So these case-selected species are going to grow slower so they can meet that carrying capacity. Um, and what helps me remember is that, and also our selected species, after we go over the traits, it helps me because R um, is rapid and these species rapidly produce. But let's just go over the characteristics first. So case selected species. So these species have lower reproductive rates, so they only reproduce like not that frequently in their lifespan. They um, have high parental care, so they take care of their young for a substantial amount of time. They have long gestation periods, meaning that they're the their offspring is in their womb for a longer amount of time. And they have relatively long lifespans, so they do live um, decades rather than just seconds or weeks. We'll get into that. So our selected species are the opposite. So they have many sp small offspring, so they have lots of um, children. They have little to no parental care, so they kind of just give birth and then just leave them basically and they have short gestation periods so they don't have it in their womb for a long time and then the species are short-lived so they do not live a long time okay so here we have a picture of two pandas they're really cute so these pandas here are just a few characteristics of pandas if you don't already know so they typically give birth to one to two babies in their whole entire lifespan so not that many Panda mother must carry her baby around very gently and take care of it until it is big enough to move around on its own. So we have this really high parental care and this really just great relationship. The gestation period is between 95 and 160 days. And the lifespan is from 15, sorry, to 30 years. So is this an R select or K select species? I'm going to let you pause the video and think about it. Fantastic job. I am sure your scientific brain got it right. And you said case selected species because yes, these, they fit all of the characteristics in this previous slide. Okay, next we're gonna look at mosquitoes. So, most females can produce between 50 and 500 eggs in their first gestation period. Right? So we have a lot of offspring in just one gestation period. The females lay their eggs and then move on to their next blood meal. So yeah, she kind of just, here you go, I just gave birth to like 500 babies and I'm gonna go eat and leave them. So yeah, and then they may produce up to 10 times throughout their life. So 10 times 500, that's quite a bit of eggs. And then the lifespan is about seven days, so about a week which is pretty crazy. So pause the video, or you might not even need to pause the video and think, is this a K-selected or R-selected species? You guessed it, it's R-selected species. Oh, this was just a fun fact I put in as well. Female mosquitoes need protein to develop their eggs, which come from your blood. So that's why, that's basically what your blood is used for, is to help them reproduce. So interesting, I did not know that. 
Okay, next we're going to talk about um, survivorship curves. So now we're going into the more um, analytical data aspect of it. So don't get overwhelmed. It may look scary, but it's not. I got this and you got it as well. So scientific, it's basically a scientific representation between biodiversity levels and their um, overall lifespan. So as scientists, the first thing we want to do is look at our labels, our y-axis, our x-axis, and any just like labels in general. So on the x-axis here, we have time. It doesn't give us a specific amount of time, so just in general. Then we have 1 to 10 to 100, um, whatever that is, and we can see that it's percentage of organisms surviving. That's really important to um, note specific details. So as scientists, we also want to analyze the trends and yeah, just the trends in the graph. So we can see that this one is really decreasing and it's like exponentially decreasing. Then this one's linear and then this one's opposite. So it kind of forms this little weird shape. So on these survivorship curves, we have three different types as it's labeled. We have type one, type two, and type three. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to determine what species fits on each of these curves. So I'm just going to give you guys an example. On the type one, this example would be humans because, you know, we have a very high percentage of organisms surviving and then we slowly die down. We don't just get like birth and then decrease exponentially. That's not what happens. You know, we live a long time. So we would be type one. Type two would be more of, um, a songbird. A songbird is type two because they kind of have this steady kind of pace going. Then we have type three, which an example of this would be like frogs because, you know, they lay their eggs and then they pretty much die after. So on this image, it says which survivorship curve is most R selected and which one is most K selected. So I'm going to give you a few moments to think about that. Great job, I love your conclusion. So yes, you are correct. This, the type one is definitely K select and then the type three is definitely R select. Type two, in the middle. Okay, so now we're gonna do a little bit of fun stuff. So where would pandas and mosquitoes be categorized on this graph from what we just did? Ban fantastic job. I'm so proud of you and your scientific discoveries. So the panda is um, a K-select, so it would be on type 1. And then mosquito is an R-select, so it would be on type 3. Okay, so just to wrap things up a little bit, um, this all ties into biodiversity, this plentiful um, abundance of life. And so biodiversity is important in a multitude of aspects. Any type of environmental science you go into, biodiversity is crucial because it makes the planet what it is. And it's really important to maintain this biodiversity in order to have a sustainable planet to live on. So what can you do? You, can, you just educated yourself. So good job for doing that and listening to this video. And another thing you can do is just recognize, again, these patterns and what you can do to be more cautious of protecting these, you know, species that might be going endangered or threatened. And, you know, pushing for legislation against that as well. That's really important. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I can think of. And you can always do some more research on your own to find way more sustainable methods to sustaining biodiversity as well. And with all of this makes a happy planet. Um, I really appreciate you guys um, listening and learning with me. And I hope to see you guys in the next video. Bye!